Welcome to Menopause Morph, your time to change. We're here to help you thrive through your menopause, bringing you experts in many fields to help you from perimenopause to menopause and beyond to become the strong, vibrant woman nature intended you to be. Hosted by Pauline McCarthy of the Pearls of Pauline. Pearls of wisdom, compassion, and joy. Hello, welcome to this week's, this year's, 2017's episode of Menopause Morph. This is our first episode of 2017, so Happy New Year to everybody! So, let me get started. Today's guest speaker, let's say, is Pauline McCarthy. Me! We, in the last year, we've been doing, every two weeks, the, the, the podcast, and We've had a few letters and comments from people asking for more of me. Not less of the experts, but more of me. So what I've decided to do is is do one week me and one week with an expert. How does that sound? I, I might shuffle them about a bit and you have two of me and two of experts or whatever. You know, it comes up. But we have some really interesting, fantastic speakers going to be this year. And uh, we have Dr. Anna Kebeka, a doctor. Well, I'm not going to give all the names out now, you know, but I'll give you them out later as they come in, get you all excited. And, and then, so this year is going to be really great because I'm going to do a lot more fun things for you ladies. I'll show you one fun thing that I made for myself. I don't know if you can see, you won't see it on a podcast, but if you're seeing this on the video later on, and it's on a video, so you, the, all the words are backwards. So this is a cup, and on it it says, I'm not the only one having a hot flush. And it's one of these cups, you know, that when you put liquid in it, the colour changes. So it was black, and now it's white with the text on it. So I designed that and sent it to myself for Christmas. <laughs> and at Christmas dinner, I was like, oh, look, I'm going to pour it up. And all my visitors had a look at my fun cup. So I was really excited about that. I'm actually thinking to, to put the text a little bit further down because if you only have half a cup, you only see half the text. So, <laughs> this is the, the prototype. Perhaps I'll sell that later on. If you're interested in that, just give me a shout or maybe I'll put some link to it in the, the notes that come with this show. Okay. It's Christmas. Well, it was Christmas time and it's New Year and it's the, uh, we'll see, the midwinter holidays, let's call them. And some of us have our kids coming back from college to visit. And in a few days' time, they'll be going back. And for some of us, it hurts just as much when they leave the second or the third or the fourth time than when they first went to college, they first flew the nest, let's say. So I want to talk a little bit about what they call empty nest syndrome. Not everybody suffers from it. Some say, yeah, great, fantastic. (laughs) There's a room I can use it to paint in or, or use as an office or whatever. But for many, including myself, it was quite sad you know it was almost not like a death but it was like a big chunk of your life you know if you've spent like 20 years looking after a child and I think they'll always be in our eyes our child our child when we were 99 and they're 60 something then we'll still be saying that's my baby (laughs) so uh for those of you that don't know I'll tell you how my first one went off and he went into college in and in the same country, Reykjavik. So it's only a 40 minute drive, but he wasn't living in the house. And a, a few days later, I was making the dinner and I'm shouting up the stairs, Benny, Benny, your dinner's ready. And my husband says to me, who are you talking to? And I says, I'm shouting at Benny for his dinner. And he went, Benny doesn't live here anymore. And I nearly burst out crying. And it wasn't, I wasn't crying the fact that I'd forgotten it. I really don't know. Yeah, I was just crying because it was it was real. You know, it was really. It's like, you know, when you have them when they're little, and you know, and they're, you're changing their nappies or their diapers, whatever you call them, and you know, you're up with them all night when they're sick, and you see them go to school for the first time, and you see all the, the milestones in their life. It's like, it's such a big part of your life that you, you don't realize just how much you have invested in that child until they leave. But my words of wisdom, let's say, are that. If we have done the right job parenting them, we have prepared them for the outside world. I think if we haven't done a good job preparing them, then we're really scared to send them out to the world because they can't cook or clean or wash their clothes or anything like that. So if you're perimenopausal and your kids are still, you know, they haven't left the nest yet, start training them, start teaching them how to 
cook and clean. Now, I, I'll tell you a little story here. A lot of people are saying they like little stories from my childhood and past and things like that. This. So this is another one. So my two grandmothers, they had opposing viewpoints about how to raise men. My father's mother, she had seven sons and one daughter. And her philosophy was, one day my son might have a bad wife and he will then have to cook and clean and look after the kids. So I'm going to teach him how to do that. So all my, my dad and all his brothers and my uncles, they're fantastic cooks and they can darn a sock and oh, bacon. My, my dad makes fantastic apple pies. <laughs> Hasn't done it for a while, I have to remind him. You know, my dad was actually a better cook than my mum. <laughs> Kudos to dad. You know. My other grandmother, she had this philosophy that what if my son has a bad wife? Then he'll have to cook and clean and do all these things by himself. So I'll do it for him now, you know, just in case so that he doesn't have to do it his whole life. <laughs> which meant that they weren't really prepared to cook and clean and look after themselves, which is not so great. So... If I was you, that was the first thing that I would get on my list of things to do is to teach your kids how to do that. Then when they do go out into the world, they, you know that they are prepared. And it's like, you know, they say, you let them fly free and if they come back, then they, they love you. And if they don't come back, they, they felt trapped and they will never come back. So we shouldn't hold on to our kids. A, a lot of people, they make this mistake of not saying oh go to a college near home you can stay home it'll save money but actually it's not the money I expect it's more that they don't want to let go they want to keep that child or that adult young adult with them for the rest of their life and really if you think about your own life how would you have felt if you had been emotionally forced to stay with your parents all your life not so great so I think I, I, I left home at the age of 20 and now when my like my sons now are 23 and 19 and the younger one he went off to college last year and he's living with his biological father in in Reykjavik and he's doing great he's got a, a he goes to college during the week and at the weekend he has a, a job a, you know part-time job and then the, the 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 holidays summer holidays now the the Christmas holidays he's working almost every day and he had one day off and he came to visit his mama, which was very nice. But I think if he had a current girlfriend, he would have been going to visit the current girlfriend. I mean, we have to try and remember what it was like when we were that age. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> you know? I think I was out, I, I definitely had more conversations with boyfriends than I did with my parents. But it's hard. And, and it's only now when you're going through it yourself that you realise how hard it must have been for your own parents. And I remember... When I came home at night, if I'd been out at a dance or visiting friends or something, and I would come in, and I, but I would always uh, open the door to the sitting room where my parents were sitting watching TV, or if they had gone to bed, I would open their bedroom door, and I'd just say, hi, it's me, it's Pauline, I'm home. I had to say it's Pauline because there's seven sisters, you know, <laughs> we all sound the same. <laughs> so one day my mother said to me, you know, out of all my children, you're the only one that lets me know that they're home. And she says, it's... It's really difficult lying there at night, wondering where they all are and are they in? And especially when you've got ten, you've got luckily you've got ten fingers to count them on. <laughs> that one's home. That one's home. That one's not. That one's not. <laughs> For me, it was it was very important to do this. And then there was one incident. Let me tell you, my parents had a wedding anniversary and they went out dining and dancing and they asked me to look after the kids. Ah, let me see what age must I must have been sixteen or seventeen, something like that. And they said they would be home I think it was eleven o'clock. So eleven o'clock came and they weren't home. And I had put all the kids to bed and I was just waiting up for them coming home. The baby the the baby was in the cot down the stairs and of course she was awake and uh, crying and, and irritable and I was holding her and rocking her and Midnight came and they still weren't home. And I started to imagine that they had been killed, they'd been run over by a bus or something had, you know, the, some car had crashed into their car. Or, you know, every horrible thing you could imagine. And then I looked at, and then, and then I looked at this young child who was less than one year old, maybe 10 months or something. I thought, 
well, you know, I'm 16. I've been raised by parents. So if they are dead, I've, at least I've had a good shot. You know, they've taught me many things and I've had a good life experience with them. This young this baby. baby. She will never remember her parents. And I started to cry and cry. And I held the baby in my arms and I was crying. And I was saying to her, oh, you're so old, poor baby. Well, what's it going to be like growing up without parents? And I was so distraught, so distraught. Then a few minutes later, I hear a key in the door. And I, t- <laughs> I ran out to the hallway and I shouted at them, what do you, time of night do you think this is coming in? You scared the living daylights out of me. I was a wee bit stronger, actually. <laughs> but I was, I, you know, like when you're, if your kid gets lost and you find them, you, you, get, you get this anger, you know, even though you're relieved, but this anger comes out. And my mother said to me, now you know what it's like for us when you guys are out and we are waiting for you to return. And that always stuck with me. And I think that's why when I got older, I always, always said to them, it's me, Mom. I'm home. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing how we can... When, when we're in that role, we learn. And oftentimes, we have to wait until we're a parent ourselves to we realise how we affected our parents. So when our young ones are going off to college or going to work in another city or something, we have to realise that they don't really know what it's like to, for them to be ripped from our hearts, even though not completely ripped from our hearts, but you know what I mean, ripped from our daily life, let's say. And of course, nowadays we are we are we are so lucky that we have a Skype and you know WhatsApp and all these other things where you can see your relatives and the grandparents can see the kids growing up, even if they're in different countries. Whereas it, when when I was a teenager, we had the telephone. <laughs> yes. But of course, it was very expensive to phone overseas. Nowadays, we're very, very lucky to have that. And even my sons live in uh, Reykjavik. I'm talking with them on Skype, talking away. And um, there's another one on Facebook. They have this Facebook Live now or just chatting away. So the, the, I I can keep up with them, you know. But the other day, I, you know, like I was phoning my dad today. I said, Happy New Year. And I was thinking, yeah, I phone my dad regularly and, you know, my kids, they don't, they don't really phone me unless they're phoning me for something. <laughs> Mama, I need a loan. Mama, I need a, a new pair of shoes or something like that. You know, but I don't want to encroach on them and say you must phone me. I think it has to come from the heart. And of course, they do communicate on Facebook, so it's not. Hopefully, it's not going to be a big deal. But I know that when they go back to college after the holidays, or like my older one, he's going to go traveling around Europe. It's going to be tough. And maybe each year it will get less tough and less tough. I don't know. Maybe some of you older ladies that have got older children that have come and gone multiple times, maybe you could write to me and tell me your experiences. Because for each of us, it's it's a different experience. For each of us, it's a different experience with each child. So what I, what I want you to, to remember is that you're not alone. That almost every mother has gone through this. And it is... Even though it, it can break our heart and there's sort of mourning in there, the best thing, if we love our kids, we want the best for them. And the best for them is to get their own wings and fly. And then one day, when they've got their kids, <laughs> maybe they'll say to us, oh, my kid's going to college, what am I going to do? <laughs> we'll say, I remember when that happened to me. So it's it's a vicious, not a vicious circle, it's a cycle of life, isn't it? A cycle, not vicious, it's a learning cycle, let's say. Yeah, the ways that I, that I cope with it was communicating with them, you know, sending them little messages on Skype or on Facebook. Or if I found something online that, that was of interest to them, like my older one, he likes photography. So if I found some article about photography or something, I would send it to him. And then it was, you know, because I didn't want them to feel that I was like, um, what's the word when you're um, chasing somebody all the time? Stalking. I didn't want them to think I was stalking them. <laughs> so I would get at least little articles or things and send it to them and say, oh, I read this online today. I thought you would be interested, you know, and how are you getting on? And then they would reply something, you know. So that was my technique. So if you have some other techniques, let me know. But I think... Yeah, definitely the most important thing is that 
if we really, really love them, then we have to set them free. So it's New Year's Day and there's a lot of things to do today. So I I just want to keep this short. And throughout the year, I want to develop more and more topics. I want to not just... Because, of course, there's only so much you can talk about in, in about menopause and perimose symptoms and, and recovering and things like that. But I want to help you all blossom and thrive through your menopause. So I want to talk things about business, how you, you know, like, because so many of us just got fed up with working for the same job or working in a crappy office and we just go there just to make the money, not because we enjoy it. I was just talking to my boy yesterday and I said, you know, okay, now's your time to make resolutions or not, not so much resolutions, but to make a Make a plan for your life. Like, what do you want out of life? Because I think that most people, it's not that they don't make a plan, or, or it's like, they, yeah, most people don't make a plan, Is they and they don't think of goals. They just, like, the first job that comes along, they take that. The first husband that comes along, they take that. The first whatever comes along, they take that. It's like, and, and situations are controlling them instead of them controlling situations. So it's like, uh, for example, if I was to say, okay, in the year 2000, well, for the next three years, say 17, 18, 19, but by, by the 1st of 2020, I want to have achieved these things in my life. You know, I want to have learned to play the piano, uh, fly in a helicopter, that will maybe be a bit later on, that's my goal. Um, I want to pay off any debt, I want to... Uh, or have this amount of money in the bank. I want to buy my holiday home in in Bulgaria. That's my plan anyway. My husband wants to live in Bulgaria half the year. Uh, but unless you make these goals, you'll never get there. And then it's not just good enough just to write down, I want to buy a holiday ho- house in Bulgaria. What I would have to do, what I, what I am doing, is write down, okay, this holiday house is going to co- cost X amount of money. How can I make that X amount of money in one year or two years or whatever the time period that is that I have and make a plan how to do that? Because if we don't plan for the future, the future will just happen without us being part of it, really. Do you know what I mean? We're, we'll just get knocked with one situation and we'll go in that direction and then we'll get knocked with another situation and go in that, that direction. But it's not the direction that we wanted. And most of the time... It's because we don't know what we want. So I really hope that you take the time to sit down and think. In this 2016, you know, we all heard that so many famous singers and actors and writers died. And it was quite shocking, really, wasn't it? But every time I heard, oh, this one died, this one died, this one died, I realised, oh, I'm going to die. Hopefully it'll be another 30, 40 years. But the older we get, every day we live... We're one day closer to the day that we die, and I'm not. I'm not trying to be morose. I'm trying to think. I, it, to me, it makes me more like, oh my god, I've only got so many days or years left to to do all the fun things that I want to do. And if we don't plan to do those fun things, we won't do it. It's like okay, most people they they'll book a holiday, and they'll plan for it. Some some people up to a year. And they'll book the holiday. Oh, yes. Like in the middle of June, they book holiday for next June. And they're thinking about it all year. And they're planning how they'll pay for it or they're saving up money for it. And that's just a two-week holiday or a one-week holiday. But it should, we shouldn't just be making plans just for holidays. We should be making plans for what we want out of life. Because when it comes to the day that we're actually on our deathbed, are we going to say, well, I regret doing that or I regret doing that. But most people actually regret what they didn't do. I will be really angry if I'm on my deathbed and I'll say, oh, I never got to learn to play the piano. I never got to learn to fly a helicopter. Because that's something that I really want to do. But sometimes people are on their deathbed and they say, oh, I, I never thought that I could do this, so I didn't do it. But now I realise I could have done it. But now it's too late, I'm dying. <laughs> So don't be like that. Brendan Burchard, he says, don't die with the song still inside you. That would be me, I sing all the time. <laughs> but you know what I mean? The things that are that are inside you, they're talents that you have to share with people. They're there, not just for you, but for the world. 
So when you make your plan, it's not just, it's not going to affect you. It's going to affect your family, your society, perhaps even the whole world. Because every single woman or every single person in the world is affected by menopause. It's either themselves, their mother, their sister, their aunt, their co-worker. But at some time during your life, everybody will be affected by a menopausal woman or will be a menopausal woman. So it's quite a big effect that we can have on the world if we as perimenopausal or menopausal women decide what we want in life and how we can improve the world by improving ourselves. So that's my challenge to you today, ladies, is write that not just a resolution like, oh, I'm not going to smoke or I'm not going to eat sugar. Or, you know, you, you have to make it very, very clear and very specific. So if any of you are, are, are following me, I've, I'm starting a new, let's, what we shall we call it, a new course with Dr. Glenn Livingston, who was on the show a few weeks ago. And he is mentoring me to lose this fluffiness that I have around my waist. <laughs> so I'll give you links to that below this. And in it, I'm doing videos. Dr. Glenn is, is mentoring me over Skype. And also I'm taking some videos when I'm in situations where I'm not eating sugar. And so far, I, I, I'm, I'm <laughs> I, I measured this piece of string and if you don't see, if you just listen to it, it's, it's a string, which is quite a, a long piece of string because my belly is quite big, actually, ladies. And I've got one knot on it. And this is the circumference of my belly. And so over the weeks, we're going to be putting the string around the belly to see if I've lost any weight or, well, I have actually lost four kilos since I started it, but I haven't actually lost any girth, maybe just like half a centimetre or something like that. But we're working on that. We're working on that. And then I have another two pieces of string and one has got two knots and that is my breast size. <laughs> and the other is has got uh, three knots on it, isn't it? Yeah. And that's my hips. Now, I have to tell you ladies, you know, I am, you know, of course I'm a sexy hot goddess, you know, but my body is quite fluffy. So all three pieces of my string are almost the same size. <laughs> Oh, and if you don't laugh, you cry. You know. So hopefully at the end of this exercise, actually, we haven't actually put a deadline on it. Well, it pro probably the end of the year. We don't want to do it for one year. Dr. Glenn, when he was doing it, he lost 60 pounds. Not 60 pounds of money for the British people, but 60 pounds in weight. But he also increases muscle mass, which muscle is heavier than fat. So you can imagine that's a lot, a lot of fluffiness that he lost. And I was very inspired by that because I, you know, I, I'm like many people that they start a, a, a diet or do this, or they lose a bit and then they gain and yo-yo dieting. And I'm an expert at making excuses and getting over things. And Dr. Glenn is explaining what, why we make these excuses, you know, and the, like the biological urges to do that. So you should follow that. Um, I'm going to call it The Pearls of Pauline and it'll be on YouTube and the video. So just tune into that. And yeah, it's going to be fun. Uh, and because I make all these excuses, I thought, okay, the only way that I'm going to get over this is to make it public so that people, they, well, I've got like the whole world watching. Well, maybe not the whole world, but I mean, it's open to the whole world to watch unless you're in a country that censors YouTube. So please, ladies, write in. Uh, give me encouragement. Uh, I don't want any trolls if you, because <laughs> when you watch it, Dr. Glenn says that you have to call your, your alter ego, this, like the, I can't remember now what you call it, this part of the brain that's got like the, the lizard brain. You know, um, he calls his his pig. And I call mine my troll because here in Iceland we have these troll things. You know? But on, on, you know, on the internet when people are writing things that are like just trying to cause arguments and cause fights and they call it trolls trolling. So if you're, if you're going to be a troll, then you'll, I'll just subjugate you like I will when we talk to Glenn and Sam. But no, like, just let's all be happy and nice and help each other through this amazing time of menopause and perimenopause. And when we're going to come out the other end, we're going to be amazing, beautiful butterflies. And with our wisdom, we will make the world a better place. So until next week, I want to say... 
Thank you very much. This is going to be an amazing journey. And I love you all. See you next week. Bye. Thanks for listening to Menopause Morph, your time to change. If you've enjoyed the program, be sure to subscribe to the next one and please leave a rating and review on iTunes to help us spread the message about thriving through the menopause. To get a free ebook, more menopausal resources, and to connect with Pauline, please visit www.menopausemorph.com. 